Welcome to Pathway. We're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we want to say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word GIVE to our text number, or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID-related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Excited to be with you, as always, all of you here in the room, all of you uh, tuned in online, all of you joining us upstairs in the venue as well. And I'm pretty sure Ron just said I could talk as long as I want to this morning. So hope you're ready for that. So uh, anyways, excited to be able to share with you, as always. If you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to turn it with me to the book of John, chapter 21. And as Ron just mentioned, as you just saw, we're going to continue this series together. We've been walking through from graves into gardens, looking at these post-resurrection experiences that people had with Jesus. And we're going to be looking at one in particular today in John 21, verses 1 to 14. I'm going to read that for you in just a moment. Uh, But before we do, I want to just kind of get our heads in the right space with that, try to connect with where the characters in the story found themselves on this occasion. And to do that, I want you to think with me for a moment Uh, about some of the situations in your own life where maybe something unexpected happened. And uh, things didn't play out the way that you thought that they would, and something kind of took a twist or a turn. It caught you off guard. It threw you for a loop. It disoriented you in some way, made you maybe have to step back and catch your breath and try to kind of get your head around things. What's happening here? And what does this mean for me? and, And what should I do next? And I think if we think about that for a moment, we have a variety of different things that can begin to come to our minds, right? Maybe something with work and maybe a challenging season at work, or maybe you lost your job, or you're looking for a job, or maybe you lost a loved one, or maybe you experienced something unexpected, uh, some kind of unexpected situation in a relationship in your life with your spouse, or with your kids, or with other family members, or friends, or maybe it was a time that that you didn't make the team, or the wrong party won the election, or uh, as we all found ourselves facing the last couple of years, kind of navigating a global pandemic, and, and walking into the unexpected twists and turns of that, or Maybe something with your health, mentally or physically, or maybe just the world in general, right? Those moments in our lives when it feels like the world is on fire, that things are just spinning out of control. Again, as we think about some of these moments and situations in our lives, I think we realize we, we can all relate to that. We have those situations. We can relate sometimes to the, to the confusion that it can often create for us. And I have you think about that as we get started today, because this is really where those first followers, those earliest friends of Jesus found themselves on this occasion in John 21. They had been walking with Jesus. They had been getting to know him and kind of slowly but surely beginning to understand who Jesus was and what he was up to and started to imagine how this was all going to fit together and connect some of the dots and, and even starting to kind of play out in their minds what role they might play in what Jesus was doing. And things seemed to be going so well. There was momentum building and And then all of a sudden, things took a turn, right? All of a sudden, Jesus is arrested, and he's tried, and he's convicted, and he's condemned to death on the cross. And then even as he hung on the cross, while maybe his disciples were hoping that somehow in a twist or a 
a turn that would have surprised everyone else. Maybe Jesus would miraculously come down off the cross and surprise the Roman Empire and finally overturn it and set the people of Israel free. And yet Jesus, he did just the opposite. As he hung on the cross, as we read in the scriptures, Jesus, what? He breathed his last breath. And he died there. And as if that wasn't enough of a surprise and and enough of a twist or a turn for them, a few days later, something even more unexpected happened for them, right? As we read in the scriptures that Jesus then miraculously, supernaturally rose again from the dead. And while they were excited about that, and while I'm sure they were overwhelmed by that in a lot of good ways, I think if they were sitting here with us today, they would say, yeah, it was great that he rose from the dead, but it was kind of a lot, It's kind of a lot to get our heads around and just wrap our arms around. There's a lot going on there that we didn't really see coming. And not only for the fact that he died and then rose again, but even for his disciples, most of which had abandoned him on the cross. And and one in particular, Peter, who had denied that he even knew Jesus in one of his weakest and worst moments. And so while there was all kinds of excitement and some good momentum in that way, there was also, I think if they were sitting here with us today, they would probably say to us, yeah, it was great all that was happening, but to be honest, just a bit confusing. What did it all mean? Where was it heading? What does this mean for us? And that's where we kind of pick up in the story as we look in John 21 today. I want to read for you verses 1 to 14. Again, you can follow along in your own Bible if you have one with you, or you can listen along and follow along up here on the screen as I read this. But here's what John, one of Jesus' closest disciples and friends, what he recorded for us, what happened this day in John 21 verses 1 to 14. He says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who we know as James and John, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going to go out to fish, and they said, well, we'll go with you, and so they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered, and he said, well, try throwing your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some there. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. It says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John who's writing this for us, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off. He jumped into the water and swam to the shore. The other disciples followed in the boat behind him, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. And then it says, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's an incredible story. Again, one of these post-resurrection experiences that Jesus kind of appears to his followers after he had been raised from the dead. And as I pointed out for you a moment ago, at, at this point in their kind of story and their journey, the disciples, these early followers, they were, they were still a bit rattled, still a bit confused. And so Peter and, and some of his companions, who most of them prior to their kind of walk with Jesus had been professional fishermen, they decided they were going to go new, do what they did best. In their confusion, they were going to go out and go fishing. And so they did. And yet, even though they were professional fishermen and spent all night out in the boat, when we read through the story, we see there that in the morning they had caught how many fish? Not a single one, right? And so you can imagine just kind of the tension building, the frustration, the discouragement, almost like adding insult to injury in this moment. And then it's in that moment, they haven't caught a single fish throughout the night. And then this character, we know it's Jesus, but they didn't know it was him yet. He, he calls out to them from the shore. He says, friends, where are your fish? And I don't know about you, but if it's me in that moment and I'm tired and I'm a little cranky and I'm frustrated and confused about my life already, I'm someone who I don't realize who it is, is over on the shore asking me where all my fish are, I'm, I'm not sure my response is going to be super warm and friendly. To be honest, I might have responded with something snarky like, what's it to you? Mind your own business, Right? Apparently, they responded with, well, we didn't catch any, right? And then so this character on the shore says, well, why don't you try throwing your net on the right side of the boat? 
And again, I don't know about you, but if it's me and I'm in all of those kind of situations, tired, cranky, confused, frustrated, and not only that, even the thing that I'm supposed to be good at isn't really working out for me. I'm, I'm confused about what's happening in my life. If someone like that yells something like that to me, I might have responded with something like this, right? Just this kind of like, <laughs> you, can you just leave me alone? I mean, this, why am I supposed to listen to you? And yet, nevertheless, they threw the net on the right side of the boat. And they went on to catch one of the probably largest catches, if not the largest catch of fish ever at the Sea of Galilee. And all of a sudden, in that moment, when, when that happened, all of a sudden, they didn't know before, but all, in, all of a sudden, in that moment, it clicked. And they realized. And John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter, impulsive as he often was, he didn't waste any time, right? He grabbed his clothes, jumped into the water, swam to the shore, the disciples, the other ones in the boat, they followed in behind him. And Peter, apparently eager to get to the shore to be with Jesus, he swims there. And when he arrives, he finds not only Jesus, but something else described for us there. I don't know if you caught it, but he, he sees that Jesus has been there for a while. He's been preparing something for them. He swims up to the shore and not only finds Jesus, but finds a charcoal fire. And one of the reasons that's significant is actually there's only a couple mentions of a charcoal fire in the New Testament. And uh, the second mention is here in this story. The first mention uh, actually just came a few days before this at, at Jesus' arrest and his trial on his way to his death on the cross. You see, the New Testament describes for us that it was around a charcoal fire that, that Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus. And so as he swims to the shore, not only did he, he find his Savior, his Lord, but it's like, Boom, right in his face. He's, it's like it brings him right back to that moment. Not only the sight of the fire, but the, the smell of the fire, right? You know how smells can do that. It can kind of, like it can just trigger for us. It takes us right back to a place or right back to a moment. I thought about a lot of different examples of that just to illustrate for you. Sometimes a certain sunscreen smell can, uh, it takes me like right to a vacation with our family on the beach or up at my in-law's lake cottage in the summer or or sometimes certain kind of car exhaust or city smells can, can take me right to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and our time there, the, being in the city when we adopted our daughter. And uh, this example is maybe a little more personal, a little too much information perhaps. Whenever I smell raw, like sewage, it, it always kind of takes me right back to whenever I have to watch the Green Bay Packers play, right? It's just like, <laughs> it's just, I'm there again as soon as I, as soon as I smell that, but... But this is how it works. And I imagine for Peter, it was like, oh man, and that, he swims to the shore, he finds Jesus, but he finds this fire and it's like he's right back there in one of his worst moments of failure and regret. And in fact, it was all part of Jesus setting up, I think, this kind of restoration of Peter and this recommissioning of Peter that uh, Pastor Ron will talk more about with you next week. But, but here they are around this fire and Jesus says, come and have breakfast with me. And it's in this, in this story and in this scene that, that we have kind of painted for us here in John 21 that I think Jesus did something for them in their confusion. That I want to point out to you over and over again in our time together today that I think Jesus actually offers to do for each one of us as well. And it's actually the big idea that I want to talk about with you today. You see it in your notes and you can fill that in or follow along there if you want. But one of the things that I think that we see in this story is it relates to Graves into gardens, as it relates to confusion into calling, as it relates to how Jesus engaged them and how I believe he wants to engage each one of us as well is this. I think we see here in this story that Jesus offers relief for our confusion. And the way that he does that is by refocusing us on our calling. And again, Jesus, on this occasion, he knew that his disciples were rattled. He knew they were discouraged. He knew they were confused. They were a bit disoriented. They weren't sure exactly all that was happening or why it was happening or what it meant for them or what they should do next. And I think Jesus offered some relief for that confusion and the way he did it, again, as we'll point out to you, is by refocusing them on their calling, the relationship with him that he invited them into and the mission with him that he invited them into as well. And I think the same relief that he offered to them in their confusion he offers to each one of us in our moments and situations 
in seasons of confusion as well. And there's a few ways that I think Jesus does this, that he offers this to us that we see in the story that I want to walk you through over the next few minutes. And, and the first thing with that that I want to point out for you then that we see here in the story is this, that Jesus begins to offer this relief in our confusion, refocusing us on our calling by, first of all, meeting us where we're at. I don't know if you noticed that or if that resonated with you as we read through the story and we reflect on that together, but it's one of the things I love most about Jesus in this story. I mean, here again, Peter and the disciples, they're, they're discouraged, they're confused, they're frustrated, they're not sure what to do next, and so they, they kind of resort to their thing, right? The thing that they know, the thing that they often turn to that uh, hopefully can offer them a little bit of relief or help them make sense of things, the thing that they can run to to kind of get their minds around things or maybe even just clear their mind a bit. The, the thing they knew best, which was fishing, as we talked about in the story. And, and uh, I think one of the things that we can think about as we think about how they responded in this is that ours may not be fishing, but even in our own lives, we kind of all do that as well, don't we? We all have our, like our thing we resort to in our moments of confusion. For some of us, not always a, necessarily a bad thing or a healthy thing. Maybe it's a hobby, maybe an interest, something you go do that kind of helps you clear your mind or get your mind around things or distracts you in some way. For others of us, sometimes it is an unhealthy thing or a harmful thing. For some of us, maybe in our moments of confusion, we, we kind of resort to an addiction or, or some other way that we try to self-medicate ourselves. Or uh, for some of us, maybe something like stress eating, right? It's like the world's on fire, things are spinning out of control and I need a row, row of Oreos as soon as possible, right? To just try to kind of find some relief in my confusion. For some of us, it's things like maybe our favorite talk radio show or our favorite news channel. And it's like we resort, we run to those things to try to make sense of the world, to make sense of our confusion, the things that we're uncertain about. And we just kind of, we all have, whatever it is, we all kind of have our, our thing that we run to or resort to. Some of it not necessarily bad, some of it, Sometimes it can be bad for us. And, and yet one of the things that I love about Jesus here is this, that even when we do that, that Jesus doesn't look at us, kind of throw his hands up in the air and say, you know what, that's fine. If that's the route you want to go, good luck with that. I hope it works out for you. You're kind of, you're kind of on your own now. But instead, what we see here in the story is that even when we do that, Jesus graciously and compassionately, he meets us where we're at and he joins us there. And uh, not only that, then the second thing that I think we see in the story that he does to begin to offer relief in our confusion is not only meeting us where we're at, but then inviting us to come be with him, right? He calls out to us. He invites us to join him around the fire, to come and to have breakfast, to do what Peter did when he realized it was the Lord, to jump into the water and to swim to the shore in order to be with Jesus. And I think he does the same for us, not only meeting us where we're at, but inviting us to come be with him. And if we'll respond in the way that the disciples did, then I think uh, he'll lead us into the third thing that we see in the story that I want to point out for you, which is this. And he, he reminds us of the basics. I don't know if you notice this in the story, but this story in John 21 of this miraculous catch of fish, it's actually, it's actually kind of a callback to another story that happened several years earlier. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, at the beginning of their relationship, the disciples with Jesus, it was another very similar in the details story of another miraculous catch of fish. It was these professional fishermen out for a night of fishing, haven't caught much. Along comes Jesus, tells them where to try. They don't believe him. They do it anyways. Boom, miraculous catch of fish. And in some ways, Jesus uses this moment, not only meeting them where they're at, inviting them to him, but then reminding them of the basics that he first introduced to them back then. It was this callback to something they experienced before. I don't know how familiar you are with that idea of a callback. Comedians actually use this all the time. If you notice good comedians, they'll tell a story or a joke kind of in one part of their set. And then later on, almost out of nowhere, they'll like, they'll call back to that. They'll re kind of visit that particular joke or story in the context of another joke or story later in their set, it's a way of kind of breeding this familiarity. It's a way of almost like an inside joke of reminding the audience of something that they experienced before. And in essence, that's what Jesus was doing with this, the disciples on this occasion. It's almost as if he knew in their confusion, one of the things that they needed is to be reminded of, of when they first believed, of when they first came to understand who Jesus was and what he was doing and what he wanted to do for them in their life, but also what he wanted to do through them in the lives of people around them. It was a call back to that. 
And not only the story itself, but even some of the dynamics of the story were reminders of the basics for these disciples of Jesus. One of the first most foundational, fundamental basics I think he reminds them of in this story is just this this idea that Jesus is Lord. In the story of the miraculous catch of fish, it's a reminder for them that that Jesus is king over it all. He's the He's sovereign over all creation. It all belongs to him. It was made by him. It all listens to and responds to him. And in fact, we were created to submit and surrender our lives into that and under his lordship as well. Not only that, but also another basic that I think we see in the story that he reminded them of that I think he'd remind us of as well is just this idea that not only is he Lord, but he's also, he's on a mission to rescue and restore. And he reminded them of this through this metaphor that he often used with them over and over again, one that was so familiar to them because they were professional fishermen. It was the metaphor of fishing, of fishing for people like they would fish for fish. And it was a reminder that he's Lord, but he's on this mission to rescue and restore, to take back everything that's been lost, to put the pieces back together. Again, not only does he remind them of that, though he also reminds them in the context of this story that While he's Lord and he's on a mission to rescue and restore, he doesn't actually need their help. He invites them to catch all these fish and bring them to shore, but when they come to the shore, what do they find? That Jesus, he already caught some. He wasn't waiting for them or dependent on them. Jesus was capable of doing whatever he needed to do or wanted to do on his own, but graciously and compassionately, He invited them to play a part, and he also reminded them that it wasn't going to be their effectiveness in joining him on mission in the world wasn't going to be because of their gifts and expertise and their great knowledge and and abilities. They tried all night long. But rather, their effectiveness would come uh, based on the ways in which they learned to listen to Jesus and be obedient to him, to throw their net on whatever side of the boat that he told them. See, he reminded them of these basics. He brought them back to when they first believed to who he was and what he was doing and what he had done for them and what he wanted to do through them. And then that led to the fourth thing that I think we see in the story, which is this, as he reminded them of those basics, he then kind of refocused them again on their mission with him. And I think he offers to do the same with us. It's almost as if Jesus, in this moment, in this story, he gathered them around the fire and it's almost as if he said to them, guys, listen, I, I know you're confused. I know there's a lot that's happened. I know it doesn't all make sense. I know this wasn't how you imagine things playing out. I know you're not exactly sure what this means for you or what happens next. But it's almost like in recalling and reminding them of the basics and bringing back to that first story and, and then gathering around the fire with him. It's almost like Jesus looked them in the eye and said, but listen, even, even though you're confused, here's what I want you to understand, guys. It's It's still me. It's the same Jesus that you first came to know way back then. And this is all part of the same story. I know it's taken some twists and turns. All part of the same story. This is all part of the same mission. And this is all part of the same calling that I gave to you then and that I still have for you now. It was almost as if Jesus was gathering them around to say to them, listen, don't try to, I know you're confused. Don't worry about trying to figure it all out. You just remind yourself of the basics and refocus your life again on your mission with me, on the calling that I gave you and the ways that I rescued you, but also the ways that I've sent you out to be a part of my rescuing and restoring work in the world. And again, as we reflect on that and think about that together, I think one of the things that I hope we'll walk away from here today with believing and seeking to do something with is that I think the same relief that Jesus sought to offer to these first followers of his in their confusion. I think that Jesus offers us that same relief in our moments and situations and seasons of confusion as well. And that if we'll allow him, if we'll uh, we'll allow him to give us ears to hear and eyes to see, to see him on the shore and to swim to be with him and to gather around the fire with him and we'll allow him to remind us of the basics of who he is and what he's done and what he's done for us and what he wants to do through us. And as we'll allow him to refocus our lives on the mission he's given to us with him. I think, again, it's not that all of these hard things suddenly go away or resolve, but I think the the intensity of them can begin to fade. And I believe that that's true, not only because of this story in John 21, but to be honest with you, I think it's true based on my own story as well. 
as I think through my own life and different seasons, different moments of confusion and frustration and discouragement and disillusionment and disorientation, I think in those same moments I've watched and I've experienced how Jesus has done these same things in my life as well. It's certainly been the case throughout my life in different moments and, and maybe especially been the case over the last couple of years. As we think about all that we've walked through, there have been plenty of moments, like many of you, we've just wrestled through so many things that are confusing and disorienting. I know for me, there have been moments of just wrestling with and being confused by things that I was facing physically with my health physically and things that I was facing mentally with my health mentally and, and even things that I was facing relationally through disagreement and division with people around me. And, and even when we think about what it means for us as the, in the context of spiritually and, and what it means for us to be the church has been confusing to wrestle with. What does it mean for us to be the church in, in our day and our changing culture? What does it mean for someone like me to be a pastor in this setting and in this season as well. And as I've wrestled through those things, just like many of you, I can tell you without hesitation, without any shred of doubt in my mind, that as I've allowed Jesus to do exactly what we read about in this story, as I've recognized the ways that he's been with me right where I'm at, he's met me where I'm at and invited me to be with him as he's kind of brought me back and taught me again the simple practices of joining him around the fire, of abiding in him, of practicing regular times of prayer and fasting and time in the scriptures, letting him speak into my life as I've allowed him the opportunity to remind me of the basics of who he is and what he's doing in the world and what he's done for me and what he wants to do through me as I've allowed him to refocus my life again on the, the simple practices of joining Jesus on mission in the world, of practicing what we talk about around here an awful lot, this idea of the blessed strategy. When as I've allowed Jesus to refocus my life just on beginning with prayer and praying for people around me in my neighborhood and my networks of relationship and listening to them and eating with them and serving the needs that I discover as I do all of that and then having opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with them as I've gotten back to the basics of just making disciples, gathering small groups of people, planting the good news of Jesus in the places of lostness around me and, and helping other followers of Jesus to go and do the same. And the simplicity of that and the basics of that is I've responded to Jesus meeting where, me where I'm at and inviting me to him and joining him on mission and refocusing my life around that again. Again, it's not that everything hard or everything challenging all of a sudden gets resolved or goes away. But there's a way in which Jesus, just as I believe he did with them, that he's offered some relief in my confusion as I've allowed him to just refocus my life on my calling with him. And again, you can kind of take this or leave this. If you believe me or don't believe it, that's up to you. But, but without reservation, I, just, I hope you leave believing today. But the thing, same thing we see in this story that I think he offered to them, that I've lived and experienced in my own story that he's offered to me. I believe Jesus wants to be true in your story. He offers it to each one of you as well. And so here's my challenge for you. Here's the thing I hope you leave here considering and thinking about as we've spent time reading and reflecting on this story together. When we walk into our own kind of situations or seasons of confusion, again, it could be a variety of things as we talked about at the very beginning. Maybe things at work are hard, or maybe you're looking for a job. It could be something with your family, your relationships, your marriage, a season of life and your parenting. It could be maybe you're walking through a divorce or you felt abandoned or betrayed by someone that matters to you in your life. Maybe it's the political landscape, as we said, or it's just the, the world with all the different things that we're bombarded with on a daily basis, the, the confusion all around it. As we walk into those moments, maybe instead of us just resorting to our thing, whatever that is that we often run to, to find some relief in our confusion, perhaps we can learn from the story and maybe find ourselves kind of choosing or committing to some of these things instead that we see there, that maybe we would first look and listen for Jesus. We'd ask him to give us ears to hear and eyes to see as he calls out to us, that, that not only that, that we would not only see him and recognize him on the beach, so to speak, but then we would do whatever it takes to, to go be with him. Like Peter in the story, that we would jump into the water and swim to him, that we would fight and contend for our time with Jesus so that he can speak into our lives and remind us of the basics and take us back to when we first believed or when we first understood that we'd be reminded of who he is and what he's doing 
and what he's done for us and what he wants to do through us. And then not only that, that we would commit to join him on mission wherever he sends us. That like the disciples, we wouldn't just try to join him in our own effort, our own abilities, our own understanding, but we'd simply say to Jesus, where do you want us to throw the net? To whom have you sent us, Jesus? In what context have you placed us with our neighbors or in our networks of relationship that we can simply join you on mission there and, and practice the, the simple rhythms of the blessed strategy, praying for people and listening and eating and serving and sharing the good news of Jesus. And then not only that, committing to share and celebrate with others. One of the things, this last part here that I think we see in the story that's easy to overlook, I want you to imagine for a moment, imagine the disciples as they gathered around that fire that morning after they hauled in that large kind of net full of these 153 large fish. Imagine their excitement. Imagine their enthusiasm. Imagine as they kind of haul that up on the shore and they look at that and you, you just imagine them pointing to that and saying, did you see what Jesus did? He did it again. Remember when he did that? Several, he's still doing it. In fact, in some ways, I think it's a picture of what the church looks like at our best. Yes, we gather to comfort and encourage each other, to help each other navigate the hard things we walk through in life. But I think also a significant part of why we should gather like we do in a space like this, like we do in our life groups and our other group environments is not only to come and to receive and to gain something for ourselves, but actually, I think at our best, we come, we learn how to listen and, and look for Jesus, how to join him on mission, how to spend time with him, so that when we gather together again, we come almost like these disciples with our nets full of fish, and we can point to it and say, can you believe what Jesus has done? As we've been obedient to him, as we've heard his voice, as we've thrown the net wherever he tells us to throw it, can you look at what Jesus is doing? And we share that and we celebrate that together. And again, I think if we commit to these kinds of things that we see in the story, it won't, it won't make everything hard disappear. But I'd be willing to bet for you that Jesus, in the midst of that, just as he did with them, as I've seen him do in my own life, that he can offer us some relief in our confusion as we allow him to wrap our lives around him and what he's doing and the calling that he's given to you and to me, to all of us again. And for any of you that are here, and maybe if you're a follower of Jesus, I think he offers that to you. But, but if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to understand something as well, that it, it may not be a reminder of the basics for you. It may be a, an introduction for the very first time. It may not be a refocus on your mission with him or your calling with him. It may be a, kind of an initiation for the very first time with him. But even if you've never bent your knee to Jesus, even if you've never put your trust in him or or come to know who he is, I think Jesus offers the same invitation to you. And I think in the same way, he promises to meet you right where you're at and to invite you to come and be with him. And if you'll respond to him in that, I think he'll do the same for you that we've been talking about this morning. He'll reveal to you who he is and what he's doing and what he wants to do in your life and also what he wants to do through your life and will offer you some incredible relief in your own confusion as you allow him to focus your life on the calling he has for you as well. As we wrap up our time together these next few minutes, we wanna do something today. I think it's so important for us to read from the scriptures as we've done and to reflect on what we're reading as we've tried to do over the last few minutes as well. But I think it's also important for us that we don't, we don't just rush out and hurry out and forget what we've talked about, but, but that we actually allow Jesus to lead each one of us. He meets us where we're at, as we said, and, and I believe there's specific things he has for each one of us that he wants to lead us into as we not only read and reflect, but look for ways to respond to what we've talked about today. And so over the next few minutes, our team's gonna lead us in a song. They're gonna play this over us. And it's a great song that reminds us that as the waves and the winds of life toss us and turn us and confuse us at times, our prayer can be just as we'll sing about in the song that Jesus would simply take us back. To him is our first love, to him is the one who's on a mission in the world and invites us into that, to the one uh, who is rescued and is seeking to restore us, but is also sending us out to be a part of that work in the world as well. And so as they play this over, I wanna encourage you just to reflect on those words, but I also, I wanna encourage you to quiet your heart before the Lord and just to ask God, what is it you're seeking to say to me today? And then I wanna encourage you to just jot down in your notes, whatever it is he brings to your mind or brings to your heart with that. And then maybe take it one step further and write something we call an I will statement around here. It's a, 
a way that we can commit to respond in some way to what Jesus is teaching us today, what he's saying to each one of us individually and what he's inviting each one of us as individuals to do. And so I wanna give you some space to do that, encourage you to take advantage of that. And uh, they're gonna lead us through about half the song that I'm gonna come and just kind of pray and kind of pray us through that reflection as well. And then they'll finish the song up for us and I'll dismiss us in a few minutes. So I'm gonna give you some space to reflect on that as they lead us. from this moment. Jesus, we didn't come here today to hear from me. We came to hear from you. We believe that you know us, that you love us, that you want what's best for us, that you'll show us a better way. We thank you for the ways that you did that through the scriptures and the stories that we find there. We thank you for the ways you're continuing to do that as you speak to each of us, as you speak into our lives. And so Jesus, before we rush from this moment, we, we just pray whatever it is that we need to do as we hear from you and seek to respond to you, Lord, would you, would you just make that clear to each one of us? Jesus, maybe for some of us, we, uh, 
Maybe we just need to believe that you meet us where we're at, that you're with us in our times of confusion. Jesus, maybe for some of us, we need to recognize that just as you did with your first disciples, you invite us to come be with you. Maybe we need ears to hear and eyes to see, to recognize you on the shore, to recognize your invitation. Coming to be with you. Jesus, maybe for some of us, we know that you're there, that you're inviting us to us, but maybe we've just allowed ourselves to be too distracted and too consumed with the things of life, the things of our own kind of selfish desires. And maybe for some of us, we just need to swim to the shore and sit around the fire with you. Jesus, maybe for some of us, we need to be reminded of the basics. We need to come back again to who you are and what you're doing in the world, what you've done for us, what you wanna do through us. Jesus, maybe for some of us, we, uh, we know you've invited us to join you on mission wherever we find ourselves. And yet that too, we're too distracted, where our lives are too consumed by other things to, to join you in that. Jesus, maybe for some of us, we've been trying to join you on mission, but we've just been doing that all in our own strength and abilities and expertise. Maybe you're inviting some of us just to acknowledge that and to choose instead to say, where do you want us to throw our nets, Lord? Jesus, maybe for some of us, we've never come to know you. We've never realized who you are. Maybe it's not a, a second miraculous catch of fish that we need, but maybe a first. We need to know for the first time who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, for those of us that are there today, I just pray that we'd be overwhelmed by the beauty of who you are, the goodness of who you are as we see in the story. And that we take the step of responding to your invitation and joining you and allowing you to reveal yourself to us, to show us more of who you are. Jesus, thank you for loving us and dealing tenderly and graciously with us. Thank you for never abandoning us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't again leave here quickly and move on, but we would seek to do something with what you've shown us about yourself today. Lord, we don't wanna waste our time and come and gather and just leave, so help us to live it out, Lord, and we'll commit ourselves to you for that. Lord, may our prayer be the words of this song as we walk into moments of confusion in our life. Would you just take us back? to you, to our first love, to who you are and what you're doing, what you've done for us and want to do through us. Refocus us again and again on our calling to you, Lord, and on the mission that you've given to us to join you in, in the world. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We pray all this in your great name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this last little bit?
take me back to my first love and everyone said amen listen thanks for being here today all of you again here of everyone upstairs in the venue and online and as you go we want you to know you're not alone on your journey if Jesus is inviting you to take a next step with him and you want some help with that, we wanna come alongside you. So we'd love for you to visit with one of our prayer team members up front or stop by our Next Steps kiosk on your way out. Again, if you're new, we'd love to meet you at guest services. And for everyone else, we hope you have a great week. Uh, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you later. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the give button on the web or the app or text the word give. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.